Hello everyone, Leslie Cornwell here, Midwifery Business Consultation. I'm going to do a presentation about American birth, the fascinating history of our maternity system. I think for birth to evolve into something more in the United States, we need to understand the history and where it was in the past. So I'll go back um, briefly the, the thousands of year history, but I more want to focus on the United States and how we are so different than Europe and where that history came from. So current U.S. statistics, compared to the 33 industrialized countries, we are ranked second to last for maternity or infant mortality and 30th for maternal mortality. So we spend a lot of money to take care of women, but we do a terrible job compared to other industrial countries to make good outcomes. Superior to saving really young babies, we by far those 22, 24, 26 weekers, we do a great job. But when it comes to normal healthy birth, my generation of women are far more likely to die during childbirth than their moms used to be. So it's drastically getting worse, not better. 70% of women are more likely to die in the childbirth compared to the US or to Europe. And so why? The World Health Organization recommends a C-section rate around 12 to 14% and in the United States it's 33% and there's many smaller communities that you can find it closer to 50-60% due to elective primary cesarean sections being offered. 8% of our deliveries are being done by midwives, mostly in the hospital setting with certified nurse midwives, worldwide, Europe, a lot of the maternity social healthcare systems, the midwife is the mainstream of who is seeing the moms. And then if you risk out of your midwife, you go see a doctor. We are the only place where high risk care providers, obstetricians do most of our deliveries, 98% in a hospital setting with a doctor. Countries with the best outcomes, Netherlands, Sweden, Denmark have universal health care and completely different maternity model. OBs, obstetricians are only used for high risk pregnancy. A vast majority of laboring women get individualized support from a midwife. Doulas are common practice and labor support is really a valued practice versus a massive assembly line where a nurse has two to three patients to take care of. The C-section rate in Netherlands, Sweden, Denmark is 14 to 18%, a lot closer to the World Health Organization's recommendations. The part that I love, Netherlands has a 20 to 30% birth at home rate. Um, many of the governments will have incentives to choose a midwife, choose an out-of-hospital birth. The postpartum home visits support systems are completely different than the United States. Our maternity services are really dictated by insurance reimbursement and quantity versus quality of care, which is the complete opposite of what you want with moms and babies. Physiological support of labor versus medical management. So there's two different models to take care of women. There's the traditional physician management, how they're trained. The birth is a disease process. It needs to be fixed and cured versus midwifery. It's a normal process with variations and having training for emergencies just in case. So the United States maternity care system is mostly births in the hospital with an obstetrician. You used to mostly get midwives at home and then in the 1920s, that really switched over with twilight sleep. Um, pain management has always been a marketing campaign to help um, the medical system get women into the hospitals. Um, so pain management with the twilight sleep, getting um, IV pain medicine, nitrous oxide, epidurals, those are things you can't get in the home setting and are not the traditional hallmarks of what people think of for a midwife. People think of natural, normal births. Um, Many of the other highly developed countries, most of it is done by midwives and they far outnumber the obstetricians. And it's always interesting to me now with healthcare being, healthcare having physician shortage nationwide, midwives aren't being looked at as the answer to the problem. It's how do we get more doctors through medical school um, to serve women. What has caused our US to be so different in our history compared to other developed countries? We started out doing births in 
thousands and thousands of years all the same, but it was that big shift of when the American colonies, the United States was being made, that European model had not always followed along with the new colonies being made in the United States. The midwives still attended the births at home. Um, the training was an apprenticeship model and there was few midwifery programs even available. Um, and there's still nowadays a lot of apprenticeship models, certified professional midwives, direct entry midwives are an apprenticeship model. Um, certified nurse midwives are a more structured nursing undergraduate and then a graduate program for midwifery. So it's each has its goods and bads. Training was the apprenticeship, there wasn't even those options. Granny midwives, more a southern states colony term, had midwives in each of their community. They were tended to be the elder of the community. They had lots of babies. They had supported a lot of women during labor and learned from the other midwives in the community. Still currently, there's no national midwifery laws present. Um, that each state makes their own laws and that makes it very difficult even if a nurse midwife has a national certification or a certified professional midwife has an international certification um, that doesn't necessarily mean they can practice to their fullest extent in each state every state has um, rules of autonomy and restriction in place so many practices had no government control in the 1920s, and as of today, there's still no national, um, and you really just have to know the state you're, you're currently in and where you're thinking about practicing to know, do you have to be affiliated with a physician? Do you have to be employed by a physician? Can you order labs, ultrasound prescriptions on your own? There's a lot of gray zone with midwives and business ownership and practicing independently for low-risk healthy women. Introduction of physicians. Medicine didn't become professionalized until the last half of the 1800s. Midwives were looked at as competition versus collaboration, which is still a big challenge today. Anytime you have consumer in demand, there's always that underlining feeling of competition versus how do we work better to take care of our families. Um, medicine had always needed the hospitals as teaching central locations and how do we teach our medical students, our residents, our next generation of physicians. When you used to have a physician come to a birth, especially at home, it was a rarity. It was usually a near death, a death experience. It wasn't a midwife was that mainstream option. And where did that shifting all happen? By the beginning of the 20th century, midwives attended only about half of the births, and now midwives only attend about 11% of the births. I would love to see that paradigm shift um, back the other direction. Dr. Joseph Dilley, very influential obstetrician in the 1900s, um, had done a lot of that shifting of mindset of obstetrics and medical management and training of the next generation of physicians versus the midwifery model as the best option for most women and the medical model is a choice for women that are higher risk. American obstetrics was still functioning under an inherent mindset of childbirth, considered birth to be a destructive pathological rather than a normal function, and where that's where that big shift of training for doctors came from. Change the focus of labor and delivery from responding to problems to preventing problems by using routine interventions versus letting birth go its normal course and being available. Routine interventions were used to save women, quote unquote, from their evil naturals to labor. So there was a lot of personal we need to save women, we know what is best, sedatives, episiotomies, forceps, routine aggressive management of women, and very inhumanely was common practice. And still, like in the 1990s, episiotomies were common practice. We finally are slowly getting out of that shift. Um, but sedating versed, um, giving women pain medication epidurals, it's numbing them from the waist down. They no longer can move. Um, so there's always a balancing act of choices versus affecting the normal birth process. Medical model of childbirth, childbirth viewed as destructive pathology rather than a normal function. That's when that big shift had happened. Assembly line, 
we need to be doing things to women versus supporting them and being available for them. Recommendations for hospital deliveries and the abolition of midwives. So it's really been a long history of challenge. 1910 obstet obstetrics was poorly trained and the implemented charity hospitals just to fill the void of having a central location to teach doctors. 1914 was twilight sleep and that was the first form of pain medication. If you've ever read stories about twilight sleep, it just breaks my heart um, that it was the women were strapped down. They were given medication to not remember it. It wasn't a traumatic birth experience. It was just one they could not remember. This was a time when family members, nobody came into the birth with them. I mean, these women were tied down. The picture just break my heart. Their eyes were covered. They just were trying to prevent them from hurting themselves during twilight sleep. So here's a picture of those twilight sleeps. It's Women had loved it because they couldn't remember. It's not that they weren't feeling the pain. It was they cannot remember the pain they were feeling. Um, so twilight sleep was a combination of morphine, scopolamine for memory loss. Um, they had oh, women would just rave twilight sleep societies and welcome the idea of medical practice. Pain was a big driving force and fear is a big driving force and it still is today. There's so much fear around birth and it's part of that marketing of I can protect you. If you deliver in the hospital, nothing bad will happen and we can make all the pain go away. And that's far from the truth. Epidural anesthesia, allergist, anesthesia is the 1990s and now is a very popular option. There's some hospitals where 90% plus are getting epidurals, but it's very common. I would say average about 50 to 60% of women are getting an epidural and it's, it works great for many women. Um, there's a timing to when it should be done. Um, there's risk involved. I did my thesis for graduate school about true informed consent of epidurals because women aren't really told the risk and benefits of what is an epidural. Could you have chronic back pain? Can you have hot spots? Can it make your baby turn a little bit funky because you're not moving anymore? A higher chance of C-section. I mean, there's so much data out there that people think, oh, I'm still going to have a normal, healthy birth and I just don't have to have the pain with it. Um, it was first implemented in the early 1900s, but it wasn't used so much for labor and birth till the 1940s. And then around 1960s, it was just used sporadically. But I would say there was a huge influx of C-sections, litigation, um, episiotomies, epidurals, and inductions in the 1990s. And that really shifted, shifted our birth um, body. Epidural anesthesia, and we talked about this already in the prior to the 1990s, the epidurals used higher concentration, similar to surgery. Um, now it's more of a balance where sometimes you can get walking epidurals, sometimes you can get um, good relief, but still be able to feel the sensations of your baby coming out towards the end, which is really helpful with pushing. So there's different variations of an epidural depending on the concentration and dosage used. Um, popularity in the 1970s came out due to the introduction of childbirth technology. That's when continuous fetal monitoring started in getting introduced. The more medical introduction of management, the higher complications, risks to moms and babies, and C-sections started to occur. Cesarean sections were implemented as a necessity, a life and death situation. Um, it used to be very high risk, scary. And now with our American society switching more to surgeries to do pro cosmetic it's not as scary to be doing surgery now, even though the risk is still present. Best outcomes for mom and baby tend to occur when C-section rates are around 5 to 10%. Once we start getting C-section rates above 15%, we tend to see overall more harm being done to our society than good. The national C-section rate in the U.S. was in the 1960s 4.5%. In 2011, 34% was pretty common, so one in three women. And the hard part was not so much, are you low risk, are you high risk? It was just luck of the draw. We couldn't find any good risk factors to say you are a higher chance versus lower chance. Women that had had C-sections, women that were heavier diabetes, 
tend to have more complications, but there was a lot of women having C-sections that had no risk factors, young, healthy, first baby, and there's a lot of trends even about the timing of the day, weekends, evenings, 5 o'clock, 10 o'clock, so there's a lot of biases in decision-making of C-section that may not necessarily be based on medical indications. And the percentage varied greatly. Some people would say, well, we have a high risk community. We have a lot of heavier women. We have a lot more diabetes in our community, but the research and evidence didn't support. It just varied greatly. Some hospitals did a better job depending on their care providers. Were they midwives? Were they obstetricians? Were they um, a community center setting where a lot more elective inductions were being offered? offered. It was the most common surgery in the U.S. being performed. And the range was 12% to 90%. So there's many different reasons why the C-section rate is increasing. There's no hard data to say one thing over another, but the theories are very linked to low priority of enhancing a woman's own ability to give birth. Care that supports physiological labor reduces the likelihood of C-sections, giving more time, looking at, other interventions or coping mechanisms that don't have the side effects. So inducing women, augmenting labor, continuous fetal monitoring for low risk and high risk women, epidurals, anytime you add an intervention, it tends to lead to another intervention. Refusal to offer informed consent about vaginal birth, especially women that had a C-section, maybe her baby was breached and there was no care provider that could do a breach delivery. Um, maybe she had heart tone concerns with her baby and her last C-section. Knowing you have an option to do a vaginal birth after C-section and a care provider that will support you do it is really hard to find in today's society. Other reasons for the increasing C-section rate, casual attitudes about the surgery, which I talked about prior, our society as a whole is more tolerant. Liability also makes that. We aren't getting sued as obstetricians and midwives for doing a C-section at this point in time. So it looks like to our society, we tried everything. A C-section is just, you know, it'll protect us and it'll protect from lawsuits. Limited awareness of the harms that are more likely with a C-section. A C-section is a major surgical abdominal procedure, increases the risk for moms and babies compared to a vaginal delivery. And sometimes because obstetricians are good at doing C-sections, that gets a little bit lost. Incentives to practice in a manner that is efficient for the providers. Insurance reimbursement really does affect how women are managed during pregnancy, birth, and labor. If you have a VBAC woman that wants to try, an obstetrician is thinking about, well, I could be in labor with her managing risk two to three days, keeping an eye on things. We don't know how long she's going to push versus I offer an elective repeat C-section. It's a 45-minute procedure. We can schedule it. I know when it's going to happen. I don't have to worry about all these unknown variables. And typically, the insurance company will reimburse more for a C-section versus a vaginal delivery. So there's a lot of things when we're not having our insurance companies paying on quality but versus on quantity. The, the art of midwifery, the art of maternal good outcomes gets lost because it's not you need time you need the complete opposite of how our reimbursement system is set up profession of nurse midwives um, there's many different types of midwifery but i'm going to focus more on nurse midwives just because they are in the mainstream medical community our cpms and direct entry midwives do a great job with home births but i think in Today's society talking about the medical community until we get more of a paradigm shift. So it had a slow rebirth of midwifery by the Frontier Nursing Services in 1925. Mary Breckenridge, the founder, was a public health nurse for the Red Cross in France during the end of World War I, where she encountered the British nurse midwives. So the European midwives were a lot longer around than the American midwives. Attended only home births until the mid-1950s when post-war baby boom and there was poor teaching hospitals needing more providers. I'm hoping we get to that other shift where there's such a demand to 
women empowering, wanting normal birth, the severe shortage of healthcare providers that midwives will truly be the, the main dominant care provider in the U.S. Nurse midwives didn't venture from poor populations until 50 years after the profession was established. By 1960s, only seven nurse midwives were practicing. I think it's around four to 5,000 now. Every state is a little different. Some have more and some have less, depending on their um, practice autonomy. I know like Alaska, Oregon, and Washington have much more progressive autonomous regulations. Southern states tend to be more restrictive. The East Coast tends to be good and bad, like maybe the state laws are pretty autonomous, but the, the hospital privileges can be a little more conservative. Um, in the Midwest, it tends to not have as many laws, so there's a lot of vague interpretation, which can be good and bad. Even though it's a small, it's a very strong influence, midwives fill a massive role. By the 1960s, there were only 70 midwives practicing. Now there's a lot more. Even the last five to 10 years, there's been a drastic increased demand for midwifery care. Family focused, prevention, education, community based, childbirth education, rooming in, not taking the baby to the nursery, allowing the dad to be part of the birth experience. Um, urging the mothers to breastfeed versus bottle. There's just huge strides midwives have been part of. As of 2003, nurse midwives are attending 11% of all the deliveries, mostly in the hospital. And I know that every year it's increasing more and more. Direct entry midwives, um, those are the ones people are more familiar with. They've been around for thousands of years. They're an apprenticeship model. Um, a lot of religious organizations that do home births tend to have direct entry midwives. So the movement really developed in the 1960s, 1970s. If everybody's familiar with Ina Mae Gaskin, her um, community, the farm, was really the direct entry midwifery model. As part of the grassroots efforts for women to reclaim their bodies, their births, and their just human rights. Mostly this care was by well-educated middle-class women wanting to choose home births. They knew their options, they knew what was available, and they had the money to be able to pay for it. And then as of 2003, four out of a thousand births in the U.S. were done by direct entry midwives. And I truly believe this is going to increase more and more. Summary of events, obstetricians like Delee helped to reduce the use of midwives by arguing that midwives were untrained and incompetent, which is still a challenge today. Pregnancy is a dangerous condition requiring care only by highly trained medical specialists. The statistics are different. If you're high risk, it makes sense to be with a high risk care provider, but most women are normal, low risk, healthy. And compared to Europe, where the health care model is completely different, the United States has a long ways to go to improve our outcomes for moms and babies. The midwives, clients, mainly poor women, were needed to provide the clinical experience for um, training obstetricians. I remember my grandmother talking. She had a few of her babies at home. Then she had a couple with the doctor at home. And when they switched to the hospital, the doctor's mentality was not it's safer to deliver at the hospital. It was a convenience. I have a few people do. It makes sense for you all to come to me versus I come to you. It wasn't about safety. Midwives attended half the births in the 1900s, and it really dipped down by 1935 to only 35%. Um, as of 2003, the last stats that we have is more of the 11%. Um, and then in the 1930s, it was more of the poor rural South granny midwives. Summary of events, 1920s with the twilight sleep. That was the first implementation of pain relief use in childbirth. 1925 frontier program for midwifery was implemented. 1970s midwifery finally started having a turn back around, showing that women, when our society demands it, can make massive changes. Um, our C-section rate is at national highs. It has to come down. We're around 33% and we should be around 12 to 14% to keep our, our moms and babies in a good balance. Home births and midwifery care are increasing in popularity. We have to get past the barriers. We have to get past 
the challenges with national and state regulations with birth centers and midwives. Insurance reimbursement has to be switched from quality versus quantity. The, our society has to demand that there's normal, healthy options and physiological support and that medical intervention should only be used for high risk women. So there's a combination of things that just need to happen for our society to sh continue to shift the right. So I want everybody to think the future of birth, the future of midwifery, the future of our United States can go two very different directions. We could go like in Brazil where it's 90% C-section elective rate, or we can go the direction of more Denmark, Netherlands, where our socialistic healthcare system supports normal, supports our moms and babies. We need to have options for birth centers and home birth practices and midwifery for women wanting to have that autonomy back. And it's great safe options. Um, AABC has done amazing studies and um, kept up with statistics of birth centers across the country. And there is amazing outcomes for normal, healthy women. So I employ everyone to think, 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 where is our future of birth going to go? We need to train more midwives. We need to support each other, decrease the professional burnout, improve the reimbursement rates for midwives. We need to show our society that this is a great option for women and families. Here's our resources, some of the great um, books that I have read. If you have any questions, you can definitely go to the website and um, ask me. I have great blogs, resources, lots of things to help and support midwifery business and getting more midwives in birth center, home birth practices, improved collaboration with physicians and hospitals. So we have a lot of amazing opportunities coming up. Um, visit our website. Let me know if you have any questions.